Please rise out of respect for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Mark 5, verses 1, Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12. Glory be to you, O Lord. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, our sermon is from Jesus' Beatitudes. Something that we, a section of scripture that we might be prone to think of as a very happy part of scripture, right? We hear that word blessed over and over again. Blessed are those. We think it's about happiness, right? Maybe we're prone to then thinking about what makes us happy. What is it that really makes you happy in life? A relationship? Seeing a job well done? Is it family or money in the bank? Or maybe just a certain vacation spot. What what are the ingredients in that recipe that help make you a happy person? Now, you know, today, Jesus, we hear him say the word blessed over and over again. And like I said, it's tempting for us to think that he's talking about happiness. In fact, the very Greek word that's used here, remember, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. The Greek word for blessed means the highest degree of happiness. Some English translations of the Bible even use the word happy here. Happy are the poor in spirit. But, but honestly, I think that translation, that use of that word, happy, in the Beatitudes, actually probably proves to be more confusing than it is helpful. You see, when we think of happiness, we tend to think of those times when good things happen to us. Right, you know, when, when we feel very blessed because all these good things are going on, right, people are congratulating us for our good fortune. Sometimes maybe we even may connect happiness with our theology. You know, believing that if God's really happy with us, then we'll be blessed, right? If we pray a little harder and believe a little harder, then God will like us a little more and bless us a little more and we'll be happy. He'll send us that job promotion or that bigger paycheck or a fantastic marriage, right? Just pray a little harder and a little longer. Now, the problem is, if that's what we're thinking of when we hear Jesus say these words blessed, then when we read through the Beatitudes, we're going to find ourselves very confused. I mean, actually, we're going to find the Beatitudes to be absolutely absurd, Jesus may say, yes, blessed are, or, or happy are, if you want to use that word, but, but then look at the things he says. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are those who are meek. I mean, it, it doesn't make much sense. It doesn't make much sense because, like I said, we live in a culture that embraces the idea that happiness is found in our circumstances. More importantly, happiness is found in ourselves, in self-pride, in ambition, in self-esteem, in being proud of who you are and and the choices you make. And so, yeah, it's always going to shock us when we hear Jesus say things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. Maybe most shocking of all is when we're going to discover that the Sermon on the Mount in its entirety, including the Beatitudes, describes that the highest degree of blessing for the Christian comes in the midst of suffering more often than it does in the midst of earthly blessing. Suffering for Christ's sake. In fact, if you really want to mess with your mind a little bit, (laughs) if you really want to see how influenced you are by the world we live in and its understanding of happiness, then read through the Beatitudes really slowly sometime. 
Take in every single line. Think about it for a second. And then at the end, ask yourself, am I really happy? Is my life really blessed right now? Because, you know, if I ask myself that question in any other context, is my life really blessed? Am I really happy? I'd probably be tempted to say yes. I mean, you know, I look at my life and it's pretty good for the most part, right? I mean, I have a great family, a home to live in, two cars, a job, enough money to, to buy food and, and to clothe my family. I've got friends. I've got lots of stuff, you know, like most Americans, stuff in my garage, stuff up in the attic, stuff crammed into the closets. I'm very blessed. And on top of all the stuff that I have, I'm free, right? We're Americans. We have lots of freedoms, especially the freedom we covet so much as Christians, right? Freedom to practice our faith, freedom to worship God, freedom even to share the gospel. Life is pretty good. We are blessed. I am blessed. But then I remember the Beatitudes, right? Remember, you're asking this question right after reading the Beatitudes. And when you take in what Jesus says, then in the Beatitudes, suddenly you have to do a double take, right? Am I really blessed at all? Because Jesus describes the blessed life as something so different from any of that other stuff I just talked about. He seems to indicate that the Christian life is more about what we lose than it is about what we gain in life. I mean, think about that very first line. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? Well, here Jesus is talking about pride. Blessed are those who have very little pride in themselves. People who begin to learn what it means to not be so egotistical in life. Not seeing the world constantly as if it revolves around oneself and what one wants or what one thinks one needs Indeed, I think pride in self is one of the biggest evils in our current age, as I mentioned earlier. We live in a society that seems to believe that just because I feel a certain way or desire a certain thing, then by default, I deserve it. But Jesus says self-gratification and self-fulfillment is not the way to being blessed. Or look at some of the other Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are meek or blessed are those who mourn. I think these are even stranger for us to hear. I mean, I don't think a single person here would think of meekness normally as a good quality. None of us would want to put, I'm a very meek person on our resume if we were applying for a job. But the Bible says meekness is a wonderful Christian asset. In fact, ministry wouldn't even be possible without meekness. And why? Because meekness, from a, a biblical understanding, meekness is the ability to endure. The willingness, really, the willingness to endure. And walk alongside another person despite their faults, despite their bad attitudes. You see, we think of meekness as weakness, of giving in or cow time, but no. Meekness is being willing to endure with another person despite their behavior, despite their bad attitude, despite their faults. Boy, that's something we have a hard time with, isn't it, in life? We tend to separate ourselves from people we don't like, separate ourselves from people who we think have made bad choices. And yet consider how ministry is completely disabled when we lack meekness as Christians. Imagine walking into a church where the moment you enter the door, you're immediately judged for all your faults. Or imagine a family where you make one mistake and everyone turns on you. Or imagine a friendship where you constantly have to prove yourselves worthy. No one would ever want to be in such a relationship as that. See, meekness, again, that willingness to bear with another person despite their faults and their bad attitude, that's what enables the ministry of the church, right? Our ability to come alongside others as they struggle in sin and bring the gospel and bring forgiveness to them. Blessed are the meek. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, another beatitude. Maybe this one doesn't sound so strange to us. I mean, I think most people in the church or out of the church could get on board with that. We need more peace in our world. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of war. There's a lot of fighting. 
going on in our world today. But you know, Jesus isn't here saying that as Christians, we're blessed if we can look at the world and identify conflict, and then we're going to go bring peace. We'll go and make peace there. No, no. Yeah, that may be needed, but the kind of peacemaking Jesus is talking about here is the kind of peacemaking that causes us to look inward more than outward. The kind of peacemakers who are willing to look at themselves and realize that more often than not, they're just as much a part of the conflict in life as anyone else. The kind of peacemakers who are willing to look at themselves and say, I'm going to stop being the source of conflict in my marriage. Right? I'm going to stop being the source of conflict in my place of work or in my church or in my community or in my friendships. I'm going to stop arguing. I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to be more loving. I'm going to be more considerate. The kind of peacemaker who's willing to realize it takes two to fight, right? And then would rather make peace than continue the conflict. And of course, you know, you could spend time going through each beatitude and applying it in this way to our lives, and it'd be pretty convicting one by one. But, you know, I think we'd find that while we may be some of these things, some of the time, occasionally, Jesus' standard here is one that I think reveals that more often than not, our lives would probably be better classified as cursed more than they are blessed, right? Because we're so seldom any of these things, and much less the whole list together that Jesus gives in the Beatitudes. You know, maybe it would be better if we just had a different list, or redefine the list, or as someone who had a lot more time on their hands than I do, but I found this other list this week, someone made a list of the devil's beatitudes. And yet it's kind of convicting how often we might find ourselves better suited to this list. Some of them being this, blessed are those who are too tired, too busy, too distracted, and they will never see beyond themselves. Or blessed are the touchy and the, self, the easily offended, for they shall stir up much conflict. Or blessed are the complainers, for they shall never be comforted. Blessed are they who say they love God, but who hold grudges against their brother and sister, for they shall be hypocrites forever. Or blessed are they who, when hearing this, think it's about someone else and not about themselves, for they shall continue to be deceived. You know, you read the Beatitudes and... Jesus' Beatitudes, and you may wonder, is there any hope for us? Because, like I said, we, we fit this second list, the devil's list, probably a lot better than his. But the unique thing about Christ's Beatitudes is that Jesus is the one who, throughout the Gospels, throughout all Scripture, demonstrates that he's the one who actually gives the very things he demands of his people. He gives precisely what he demands. He doesn't say to self-centered people like us, Get your act together. Prove yourself worthy before you come asking for my blessings. No, instead, he's the one who teaches us that we're not blessed because we've done something for him. Because we've gained God's approval. No, we're blessed simply because he declares it so. For all of us, for all saints who are sinners, right? <laughs> for all sinners who are simultaneously saints, our blessing comes because of God's word and what it makes certain of us, right? As God says in Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. You see, I teach my confirmation kiddos this for the two years that I have them over and over again. That when it comes to reading God's word, we've, we've got to get out of the mindset of trying to think that the Bible is just some rule book. And if we can follow the rules and get on track, then we'll be blessed. Now, the key to reading the scriptures is finding Jesus Christ, wherever we are in the Bible. Seeing how the scriptures point us to Christ, his death and his resurrection for sinners like us. Indeed, the key to reading the Beatitudes, this sermon that Jesus preached up on a mountain, is about realizing what else Jesus did up on a mountain. Right, The cross that he bore up a mountain at the end of his ministry, the cross upon which he died on a mountain. At the end of Jesus' ministry, he would very much put into practice what he preached. He would be the one who suffers the cursed 
so that others might be blessed. He would be the ultimate peacemaker, the one who was ultimately meek, bearing with sinners like us and all of our faults and all of our bad attitudes so that we might have the blessing of God. Indeed, so that we might realize the blessing of Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Yeah, you know, as products of this world, you and I, we might too easily be tempted to think only in terms of happiness, even when it comes to the way we approach God's word. What's in it for me? How does this bring me blessing? And yet so often we find ourselves disappointed, right? Because in the midst of it, we want to associate our happiness always then with the things that happen to us, with our circumstances. How many presents we receive, how much money we've got, whether we have the bare necessities, right, food to eat or, or central heating. <laughs> how many times do our attitudes, do our words, our behavior reflect circumstances around us? How many times do we think that that's where blessing lay? And if I don't have such things, then I'm cursed, right? God must be upset, or I've done something wrong. But in the, attitude, in the Beatitudes, Jesus offers a blessing far greater than any good fortune that may befall us. He offers himself. He reminds us that happiness doesn't come from what happens to us. It comes from what happens within us through faith in our Savior. Here the Lord's offering us a deeper meaning to what it means to be blessed. That it's a joy that we can possess that does not reside in the pursuit of happiness, but rather in the pursuit of Christ. And there you have it, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what it means for us to be blessed, to pursue Jesus Christ because he has pursued us. Good fortune, ill fortune, good things, bad things, they're going to happen all the time in this world. Sometimes in seasons, right? When it rains, it pours, <laughs> But in the midst of it all, even when we seem to be in a really rough season of life, you and I as God's people, we have a choice. And our choice isn't just to either focus on the negative or the positive, right? Focusing on the negative and only complaining or focusing on the positive and thinking that, you know, through positive thinking we can work our way to a better future. No, for you and me, our choice lies in something very different. The secret for us is realizing that the heart of contentment and that true and lasting joy comes from the fact that we have a God who is capable of turning the curse of the cross into the greatest blessing of forgiveness, overcoming the grave itself and promising you and me and all saints the hope of eternal life in heaven. And if he can do that, then indeed he has the strength to deal with all the problems and all the tribulation that we may ever face in this life. In light of that promise and that certainty, Jesus then says, blessed are you. In Jesus' name, amen.